The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Later in the program, we will bring you an important message from Mr. J. Edgar Hoover on our nation's internal security. A shrewd psychologist who has had contacts with numerous leaders of American business once remarked, Success and self-confidence go hand in hand. Men who have a strong conviction that they're going to succeed are the ones that rise to the top in every field. For people of this type, people who have this feeling of certainty about themselves, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has created its famous life insurance plan for men and women on the way up. Do those words describe you? then you'll be interested in about 14 minutes when I give full details of the equitable plan for men and women on the way up. Tonight, the subject of our FBI file, Extortion. It's titled, The Straw Hat Shakedown. many different types of lawbreaking with which your FBI is called on to deal is one large group which might be classified as crime by terror. In every case, the basis of such a crime is a threat. Call it blackmail or extortion. And the threat is undesirable publicity for the victim. Call it racketeering. And the usual menace is damage to the victim's property or his business. In almost every case, however, the threat is fundamentally a bluff because the criminal has good reason to fear publicity even more than the individual he threatens. When the prospective victim keeps his head, he can turn this fear to his own advantage by immediately reporting the matter to the proper authorities. Tonight's case from the official files of your FBI is the story of a person who lacked the moral courage to call on the local police for help. The results, as you will see, were tragic. Tonight's FBI file opens in a New England state. It is late afternoon, but still light enough to read the freshly painted words on the side of a large barn, Grandview Summer Theater. In a field beside the barn are the actors waiting for rehearsal to start. Seated in an ancient weather-beaten wicker chair is a middle-aged woman. A casually dressed, good-looking man approaches. Hello, May. How are you, Elliot? Oh, bored, thank you. The quiet countryside, how I loathe it. <laughs> Has the Gowlighter been around? Oh, no, darling. Our dear director doesn't mix with the actors. <laughs> Familiarity breeds that thing, you know. Well, I must say this summer bids fair to be as ghastly as the rest of the season's been. Slow year, dear? Oh, one show that staggered to Broadway and a month on the road with a well-basted turkey. Where'd you play? Mostly towns where the audience ate their young. Mr. St. Clair, I wonder if you'd run over our scene. I'd like some advice. Buy a textbook on plumbing and study it thoroughly. Oh, I'm serious. Uh, Having watched you through one rehearsal, so am I. Well, I don't consider that very funny, Mr. St. Clair. I didn't intend it to be young man, now scat. Scat! I'm sure it will. I'd forgotten how tender a juvenile can be. Oh, I wish I could forget this whole engagement. I'd like to be in a plane right now, winging westward to the land of the cinema. Well, darling, why aren't you? (laughs) It has to do with money, dear, lack of it. Mr. St. Clair, may I talk to you, please? Surely. I was given to understand that you'd played this part before. That's true, several times. This uh, same interpretation? Yes, why? Well... Well, to be honest, I sense a lack of feeling, Mr. St. Clair. I don't quite believe this man you're doing. I'll consider that a matter of individual opinion. I'm afraid it goes beyond that. I'm billed as director of this piece. 
I want the performances up to my standard. Uh, we'll do a complete run-through in a few minutes. Let's bring him to life, St. Clair, shall we? <laughs> Bless his little pear-shaped tones. Bless his little pear-shaped head. <laughs> well, I may go off the dry tonight. Well, can you afford a bottle, dear? I don't have to. Didn't you see the invitation? To what? The company's been invited to a party that's being thrown by the patrons and patronesses. Ah. Here, read all about it. Ah. Are these patronesses? Uh-huh. Yeah, they look like pictures on canceled stamps. Ha-ha! <laughs> hey! What? I know one of these fair damsels. <laughs> Is that a boast or a confession? Boy? More than that, darling, it's a reprieve. <laughs> Hey, darling, where have you been hiding? I've been right here, taking dead aim at the punch bowl. <laughs> have you dug these people? No, I've been too busy, Elliot. Just sample that slob over there in the bilious green. Oh, Elliot, you're cynical. Yeah, and what makes you such a little ray of sunshine? The punch bowl, darling. Oh, uh, pardon me, honey, I see my friend has finally arrived. Oh, I didn't know you had one. <laughs> Edith? What? Ellie. I'm sorry to surprise you like this. Well, what are you doing here? Oh, I'm one of the trained seals on exhibit. Real live actors and not 20 inch, life size. You're a m member of the company? Yes, I was a last minute inspiration on the part of the management. Oh. Well, your joy at seeing me is touching. What did you expect? Oh, I thought there might be an ember. You're wrong. That obese little man who just gave his hat to the maid, is that your husband? Yes, and, and I... Just a minute. He's paying his respects to the hostess. He'll be a while. Please let go of my arm. He's gotten rather flabby, hasn't he? Elliot, please. Darling, I want you to meet me at the barn in an hour. No. We can't I, talk I, here. But, but I, I don't want to. Edith, dear, you know my temper. I'll be at the barn in an hour. Don't keep me waiting. Edith? Yes? I'm on stage. I thought you'd enjoy meeting here in the set. Helen, I... I can't stay long. Oh, but darling, this is the first time we've been alone in ten years. I... I don't know why I came here. You came to see me and to go through my scrapbook. Your scrapbook? Sure, I thought you'd be interested in the progress I've made since those days. <laughs> Look, this is two seasons ago. Cyrano... And why they picked Ferrer to do the picture after my notices at the Wellington Drama Festival is beyond me. Elliot, I must go. Wait. I knew you'd want to see this picture of us. You kept that? Of course. And then this one of you. Actress arrested in extortion plot. Actress Edith Wayne this afternoon was arrested by police as she attempted yes, to... Yes, I remember. Yeah, but look at the picture. You handcuffed to the marshal on your way to jail. Elliot, what do you want? I'd like to sell my scrapbook. Nobody knows better than you. I wasn't guilty that Edith, time. Edith, darling, I need money quite badly. My price for the book is $5,000. Five? That's ridiculous. I couldn't get that darling, much in Darling, you a... couldn't possibly have married that Cretan for love. I want $5,000 from either you or Mr. Calhoun. And I want it Saturday night. <laughs> The following day at an FBI field office in a nearby city, Special Agent Jim Taylor returns from the file room to find an old friend, Grandview Chief of Police Earl Fremont, waiting for him. Well, hello, Earl. Hi, Jim. How's the fishing been? Well, don't spread this around, but since I became chief, I haven't had a rod in the water. <laughs> Is Grandview that crime ridden? <laughs> Seems like it. I'm down here today on one, as a matter of fact. Oh? Uh -huh. I thought maybe you'd give me some help. Sure, what kind? We had a jewel robbery reported this morning. First one of the summer. If I can solve it, maybe we can keep from having another epidemic of them like last year. Any FBI jurisdiction? No, not that I know of, but I've got a list here. 
These things were stolen from a Mrs. Calhoun. Mm. When? Well, she doesn't know. She says when she went to her jewel box this morning, it was empty. Well, it's a nice haul for somebody. Mm-hmm. If you'll send a copy of this to Washington, Jim, for your national stolen property file, it might help. Sure, we can do that. Well, when are you taking your vacation this year? I can't even put in for one till I get this desk a little cleaner. You come up our way when you do. I'll guarantee you a limit catch every day. Okay, that's a deal. And, Earl, when Washington reports on any of this jewelry, I'll call you. traveled as much as I have, and one has seen snow-crested mounts of, uh, when one has seen snow-crested mounts, snow-crested, oh, yeah, yeah, snow-crested mounts silhouetted against a leaden sky. Oh, come in. Oh, Edith, darling, come right in. (laughs) Sit down, darling, I've just been studying. Even though I've played this thing three times, 150 sides is still a mouthful. (laughs) I don't suppose you'd care to cue me. Elliot, why did you mail me that letter? Oh, you received it? Yes. I was shocked. Oh, but darling, in every drama, the letter plays an important part. I suppose you were shocked by that part about killing you? (laughs) That was merely for dramatic effect. (laughs) Now, did you bring the money? Yes. Splendid. I'll take it, please. First, I I, I want to promise. Of course. You'll never ask for more? Oh, I'm surprised at you. Do you promise? Solemn. Now the money. Here. Elliot, is this all? Yes, darling, and don't feel badly. Your money's going to a worthy cause. With it, I shall be able to invade Hollywood, and all because of the inspiration you've given me in this envelope. Taylor speaking. Jim, this is Earl Fremont. Oh, yes, Earl. You can notify Washington to cancel the notices on that stolen jewelry I located it this morning. Oh? One of the loan companies up in Portland called when they got my circular. Did they give you a lead on the thief? There wasn't any. What was that? The company made a loan on the jewelry to some woman. When they gave me her description, I got suspicious and drove up there. Oh, what for? To show them a picture of Mrs. Calhoun, the woman who reported the theft. Oh. They identified her as the person they made the loan to. Positive I then? Yes, and I made double sure. Oh, how, Earl? Well, they gave her a certified check, which she took to a bank around the corner and cashed. The bank teller also identified her picture. Hmm. She said she got the money in small bills. How much? $5,000. Well. The teller thought it was odd, so he gave her new bills and made a note of the serial numbers. Earl, this uh, Mrs. Calhoun tell you why she did it? I haven't been able to reach her yet but I left a message at her home for her to call me. Uh Hey, if you get a chance, let me know what she says, and I'll uh, I'll notify Washington to cancel those notices. Why doesn't the fool leave the curtain down? He wants to see how many times I can bow. Thank you, thank you, you fools. Keep it down. Well, Mr. St. Clair, what did you think of that? Of what? I got three big laughs tonight. Child, those weren't laughs. The audience was breathing a sigh of relief at your departure. Don't let him kid you, Joe, dear. Oh, oh, I understand, Mr. St. Clair. We'll see you both at the party. Oh, I'm glad I was never that young. (laughs) Oh, pardon me. Uh, Well, Mr. Gibson, uh, I trust the reaction pleased you. Oh, they liked it fine. I didn't, and I only tried to please myself. Well, I thought we were perfectly wonderful. Oh, Miss Perry, the theater is an art form, and in art there is no such thing as perfection. See footnote, page 38, Stanislavski strikes back. All right, St. Clair, I've tried to be pleasant. Did you hear the news? The party's off. What? No. But the party for me? Well, it can't be. I only heard it five minutes ago. I'm sorry, Mr. Gibson. They just got word out front about that woman who was a hostess. Mrs. Calhoun? Yeah. This afternoon she committed suicide. We will 
return shortly to tonight's case from the official files of your FBI. Now for a moment, let's consider an entirely different type of case. One which shows American life and American character at its best. The case of Harry Stratford. Harry got out of the Navy early in 1946, landed a job as an advertising writer and made good. His starting salary was small, but he's been raised again and again. Today, in his early 30s, he is still on the way up. Isn't that so, Harry? Well, let's hope so, Mr. Keating. Three years ago, Harry heard about a special Equitable Society life insurance plan for people of his type, made to order for men who are determined to get ahead. It's known as the Equitable Plan for men and women on the way up, for people of any age who expect to advance in salary and responsibilities in the years ahead. It differs from other life insurance plans in one important respect. It's flexible, can expand or contract. When your income goes up, your insurance can keep pace. In short, this plan is geared to your future success. Last year, I got a pretty nice raise. I figured this was a good time to take advantage of one of the options in my equitable plan and move up into a higher life insurance bracket. The second big advantage in this equitable plan is this. Until your salary does go up, the cost of this plan can be kept exceptionally low. Yet your family gets the life insurance protection they need. While I was earning less, I paid less money on my equitable plan. So life insurance never became a burden. Why not take a leaf from Harry Stratford's book? Ask your Equitable Society representative for full details of the equitable plan for men and women on the way up. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Straw Hat Shakedown. One reason for the tragic suicide of Mrs. Calhoun in tonight's FBI file is the complete inconsistency of present-day society in its attitude towards men and women who have served prison sentences. We want them to reform, and yet make it immensely difficult for them to do so. Their record becomes a lifelong handicap. Many employers turn them down for jobs. So-called respectable people refuse to associate with them. The end result is to drive many of them back into the criminal career from which they have sincerely wished to escape. Today in this country, there are thousands of men and women on parole, others just released from prison, who are looking for a second chance. They should be given that chance. Tonight's FBI file continues at the FBI field office the following day. Special Agent Jim Taylor is at his desk when his phone rings. Taylor speaking. Earl Fremont, Jim. Oh, yes, Earl. More news on that jewel robbery. Oh, well, you didn't have to call me, Earl. You could have dropped me a line. No, I called because uh, you're in on it. Oh, how come? Mrs. Calhoun, the woman who robbed herself, committed suicide yesterday. Uh. I found a suicide note, also a typewritten extortion letter threatening her life. Was that mailed to her? Yes, I've got the envelope. It was postmarked here in Grandview. Well, that gives us jurisdiction, all right. I'm sending the notes down by messenger. Good, I'll get them over to our lab. I also sent along Mrs. Calhoun's jewel case. I found it empty beside her body. It's got some prints on it. Fine. Oh, uh, Earl, have you been able to develop any suspects? No, not yet. All right, I'll start up there right away. Kodak, please. Okay, Mr. Gorby, I forget Mr. St. Clair isn't here. Not yet. He'll show up. Mr. St. Clair was due and everybody else. Did someone mentioned my name. I suppose you've got a good excuse for holding up the entire company. I was tired. Well, so am I. 
I'm tired of you and your lack of regard for your fellow actors. Dear boy, I make you a gift of my part. What? As of Saturday night, I am no longer a member of this taffy-pulling society. Huh? Elliot! Your notice is accepted. St. Clair, I wish you wouldn't go. I was learning so much from you. Thank you. I will cherish and press that in my memory book next to my laundry bill. I thought you were playing out the string to get some wardrobe money. I can make this much stopping runaway horses. Tell me where. I'll go with you. Mr. St. Clair, you're staying with us through the Saturday night performance, I believe. If that's right. Then you still owe me this rehearsal time. Now let's do a little work, huh? that Mrs. Calhoun case took another turn. Which way, Jim? Well, I didn't report it back on those fingerprints from the jewel case. They were hers. Oh, well, nothing odd about that. No, no, but Mrs. Calhoun had a record. A criminal record? Yes, yeah, she was arrested ten years ago for extortion. Served three years. Hmm. I'll bet no one here in Grandview even suspected that. Her name then was Edith Wayne. She was arrested delivering a note. She said at the time she got it from someone named Parker. They ever find this uh, Parker? Yeah, but he wasn't prosecuted. He denied her charges, and there was no way that she could prove them. Parker, the extortion note I found by Mrs. Calhoun's body was signed with the initials G.P. Parker's first name was George. Yeah, could be he came back. Have you got anything on him? No, no. As I said, he wasn't prosecuted. I got what might be a lead from Mrs. Calhoun's chauffeur. No? He told me he drove her to Portland and back the day she took the jewelry to the loan company. Oh, back to the Calhoun home? No, to a barn they're using for a theater out on Route 11. The chauffeur says she held a manila envelope in her hand all the way down there. When she came out of the theater, she didn't have the envelope. That could have been the money. Well, if it was, she gave it to somebody in that theater. Mm -hmm. Have you been over there yet? No, I, I just got this dope on the phone. Well, come on, Earl. Let's drive out to the theater. <laughs> now, everybody. This is Chief of Police Fremont. He wants to ask you a few questions. Thank Chief. you, Mr. Gibson. The uh, specific day I want to ask all of you about is last Thursday. Now, to refresh your memory, that's the day after the patrons and patronesses had a cocktail party for you. Well, we rehearsed here that day, Mr. Fremont. All of you? Sure. Yeah. That's right. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll show you a picture of Mrs. Calhoun. Can you all see it? Now, we know Mrs. Calhoun visited the theater Thursday during the rehearsal. She came here, stayed a while, and left. Who did she see? Well, let me put it another way. Did any of you see her? May I have your name, please? May Perry. Did you see Mrs. Calhoun? Nope. Your name, please. Elliot St. Clair. Did you see Mrs. Calhoun? No. Earl. Earl, can I see him? Sure. Mm -hmm. Pardon me. Oh. I just checked in the office. The extortion note was typed on the theater's typewriter. You sure? Well, just about. I'll drive in and have the lab go over both samples anyway. Good. Keep questioning them. I'll see you at headquarters as soon as I can. Earl, the lab just confirmed our theory. The typewriter was used on the note, but it's no help. No, why not? Well, I just found out that typewriter in the theater office is almost public property. The actors use it, the office help uses it, the stagehands borrow it sometimes. It's all over the place. So even knowing the note was written on it doesn't pinpoint any suspects. Yeah, that's true. Uh, if we only had a fingerprint or some physical clue we could work on. In your questioning, did you touch on that GP business? I asked if any of them knew a man named George Parker. None of them did. Oh, I brought Edith Wayne's record back with me. Here's all we've got on who Parker might be. Said he was a male model living at 33 Madison Street. Well, Jim, how about checking there? I did. Nobody remembered him. If we could only get some kind of description... Wait a minute, Earl. Might... I think I'll go into town and cover one more angle. I'll be back as soon as I can. Leave it down. Smile at the nice people. I hope all their children are ushers. Well, I'm a 
free man at last. You're still leaving tonight? On the 1 a.m. milk train. Don't curdle too much of it. <laughs> Elliot, can I say goodbye? What did you call him? Elliot, that's his name, isn't it? Hey, darling, he is human. We were both wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, we haven't gotten along very well together, but that's no reason for you to leave with bad feelings. I'd like to shake hands and wish you good luck. I'm not holding it out forever. I wouldn't if I were you. It'll get tired. You shouldn't have done that, Elliot. Oh, this business of forgetting hate in a moment of sentiment is asinine. Why should I give that imbecile a chance to feel noble? So long, trooper. What? I wish you weren't going, Mr. St. Clair. Ah, uh, but alas, I must so hail and farewell my fellow thespians. <laughs> Aren't you going to put any pebbles in your mouth? I'll think of all of you with utter revulsion as I lie in the sun beside my swimming pool. Goodbye, you slaves. Just a minute. No autographs, please. We don't want your signature, Parker. We want you. <laughs> George Parker was convicted in federal court of the federal extortion statute and sentenced to serve five years in the federal penitentiary. Special Agent Taylor and Chief Earl Fremont were able to arrest the guilty extortioner because of that last trip Taylor made back to the city. By canvassing every model agency in town, Agent Taylor found one which had in its files the picture of George Parker, a picture which revealed him to be the man now using the alias of Elliot St. Clair. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here is a vital message on our nation's internal security from J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Mr. Hoover's message is, and I quote, Espionage is the obtaining of confidential information regarding the national defense and furnishing it to unauthorized persons to the detriment of the United States or the advantage of a foreign power. The American people have been requested by the President of the United States to report immediately to the FBI all information concerning allegations of espionage within the continental United States and the territorial possessions. Now, one last word on the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Remember, it's made for the man who knows that the day's not too far away when he'll tell his wife, Hey, Madge, good news. I've been promoted to a bigger job. Are you that kind of man? Then don't wait another day. Ask your Equitable Society representative to work out your own personal plan for a man on the way up. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Its subject, robbery. Its title, Old Mother Larceny. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of places or persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Betty Blythe, Betty Lou Gerson, Terry Kilburn, Jack Laird, Henry Morgan, and Vincent Price. This Is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling transcribed story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Old Mother Larceny on This Is Your FBI. Stay tuned for the adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. There's fun for the whole family when Ozzie and Harriet come your way next. This program came to you from Hollywood.